Hello and welcome to another episode of Unearth Horticulture. Today I am introducing a new mini series that is based on basic plant morphology. And morphology at a really with a really basic definition is just the study of the physical characteristics of plants. So that's a basic definition. Really, it just means plant parts. It's the study of plant parts. So the leaves, the petals, the roots, all of the different parts of the plant are studied in morphology and they are designated specific terms. I know when I was at K-State, we had to take a huge exam that really we were quizzed over hundreds of different morphological terms. And that was just to help us better understand what they meant uh, so we could read textbooks and really get dive down deep into plant pathology and physiology and how plants really work. So on a complex level, it's really great if you're interested in getting a degree or higher education. But on a basic level, morphology is really applicable to the home gardener and plant collector because it helps you to better understand your different varieties of plants and how they function, how they, uh, if, they're, if they're staying healthy, and really it's just cool to look at the different parts and how they can differ from plant species to plant species. So I have several examples here today of different plants and in this series, I'm going to do that. I'm going to collect samples and I'm going to show you and we're going to focus in on one plant part and I'm going to talk to you about those. Try to keep it brief and not too nerdy, although I already feel that I'm getting a little nerdy with this. Uh, and I'm just going to show you what I think is interesting and maybe some modifications of those plant parts and you'll get what I mean when we get going. So today the focus is leaves. So we are going to take a closer look at what leaves can look like on different plant species and I'm going to talk to you about what actually classifies a leaf as a leaf. Broadly defined, a leaf is the blade-like or palm-like structure on a plant that is the main photosynthesizing part of the plant. So it is the part of the plant where most of the sugars are produced, most of the light is taken into the plant and utilized to produce food for the rest of the plant, sugars for the rest of the plant. Now, there are always exceptions to that rule and I'm gonna to talk to you about some exceptions, some modifications. I have lots of examples here to show you today. So first I'm gonna show you the exception to the rule and that would be your family of cacti. Now, I have a roadkill cactus here, which looks really crazy, really cool. And I have lots of those for sale on the bus if you, if that, if that look speaks to you. Um, but I also have this Kansas prickly pear cactus that I harvested foraged from our prairies. And the reason this is an exception to the rule is because the leaves on this plant are actually the pokey spines, the evil looking spines. Those are the leaves in this situation and the the paddle part of the plant, the green part, the main photosynthesizing part is the stem. It's a modified stem. So in the cacti world, actually, the leaves are not the main photosynthesizing part of the plant. They're actually, the leaves are the spines and they're modified to protect the plant, physically protect the plant. So that's a cool exception to the rule. The next Thing, I wanted to talk to you about a few leaf modifications. Some, some leaves are a little bit, they're serving functions that are a little bit out of the ordinary for what you might think of as a leaf. Now that, the obvious one, the first one is succulents. Now succulents, technically cacti are succulents because they have a stem or leaf that functions as a storage organ for water. Now succulents in, in general, succulent leaves in particular, they store water in their leaves, these plants. So this is an aloe hybrid. I have an echeveria here. I have a little donkey tail. I have a string of pearls, a peperomia, a string of turtles, and this little spiderwort trade scansha kitten's ear plant. Now, all of these have one thing in common, and that's that they store some, they store water in their leaf tissue. And they've developed that way in nature because they, they're native to places where they have to go through periods of drought. 
and they need those wa that water stored in their leaves for periods of time when they're not getting enough water from their roots. So these type of plants are really cool because their leaves are really thick and really succulent, really juicy. <laughs> Um, one thing I wanted to mention, another cool modification about this trade scantia, this kitten ears, is that it's got leaf hairs on it. Now, leaf hairs, uh, trichomes is what they're better known as, are developed, there's, there's lots of research being done on trichomes, but they're developed, uh, in theory, one of the reasons is to protect, is to create a boundary layer of humidity around the leaf and protect those leaves from losing water. So that's another leaf adaptation modification so that it can the leaves are protecting itself from losing too much water all at once being wind whipped you know kansas we have a lot of hairy plants in fact a lot of sunflower species have hairy leaves to protect them from losing too much water from from our our high winds okay so we talked about succulents um and i wanted to talk about air plants i couldn't do this video without talking about air plants because their leaves are are the main function of the plant is their leaves are to take up water. Uh, actually, in general, most plants, their leaves don't take up water. They are not developed to take up water and they could not survive without their roots. But air plants actually, while they can develop some roots and they often have some stubby little roots at the bottom, they can survive just fine by taking up water through their leaves which is a really cool adaptation of that particular type of plant's leaves. Okay, one last cool function, adaptation, modification, is this donkey tail that I showed you earlier. It is a succulent, and a lot of succulents have adapted. Their leaves are really brittle and can break off easily, and when they drop to the ground, they use that store of water and nutrients that are stored in their succulent leaves to produce roots and baby plants, more leaves to, to develop smaller plants. They use it to reproduce, asexually reproduce. And that's a really cool function of a lot of succulents. It's a way that they spread without using seed. So that's one cool way. Uh, a lot of plants are easily propagated by their leaves. Let's see. Next thing I wanted to talk about is uh, leaf form. Okay, so there are lots of different shapes and sizes of leaves, and that's my favorite feature of, of a plant is their leaf form. This is a fl uh, green Florida philodendron, and it has really cool uh, lobular leaves. They've got lobes on them, and you can see them curving in and out. I really like that. It's really thought that plants sometimes develop those lobes to have a greater surface area to photosynthesize while allowing light to penetrate the canopy of the plant so that it can reach and warm up and stimulate that root zone. Uh, there are a lot of theories and research done on it, but I'm not sure there's a surefire reason why plants have different leaf forms like that. I think it's just to be cool and diverse and awesome. Uh, this is a dragon tail plant leaf, and it has what's called fenestrations, leaf splits, or windows in a leaf. This one is a unique plant because the it actually fringes out. The fenestrations extend all the way down into to the midrib of the leaf. However, sometimes uh, with like Swiss cheese plants, the mini Swiss cheese vine, or even the the full Monstera Swiss cheese plant, uh, the Monstera deliciosa they sometimes just have smaller holes in their leaves. So it can come up in many different forms. Similarly, it's thought that they, they fenestrate to allow some of that light down into the lower canopy of the plant. Okay, so we talked about some leaf forms. Uh, another cool leaf form is this Hindu rope, Hoya compacta. It has really crinkled in leaves and Sometimes uh, plants do that as a way to protect their leaves from, from water loss, you know. Less surface area is exposed out to the dry environment, so it helps that plant retain water a little bit better. Uh, Hoyas in particular are known for their thick, waxy leaves and flowers that can withstand bright temperatures and really droughty periods. Not a lot of water for their roots. Next thing, we talked about leaf form. I wanted to talk about leaf color. Okay, so I've got this Chinese evergreen, this aglaonema here, 
And then of course, a beautiful Rex Begonia. These are really known for a pretty, pretty pink coloring. And then I have this cute Fetonia or Nerve plant. All of these plants have a little bit of pink or reddish hues in their, in their leaves. And those are produced by pigments called anthocyanins. And leaf pigments, there's a lot of research done on them, but they have reasons for producing these colors. Anthocyanins actually can protect a plant's leaves from, uh, from sun scorch, and they often appear when a plant is stressed or wounded. Uh, for example, in a fiddle leaf ficus, or a lot of the different ficuses, they turn red where pests have bitten in and damaged and wounded that plant. So you can tell if you have pest damage right away by checking your plant for those red speckling where you might have had maybe mite feeding damage. Sometimes it's produced when a plant is a little getting a little bit too much sun. Uh, those anthocyanins are almost produced like uh, like they're like if you were to get a sunburn or a tan on your skin. That tan is there to protect you from UV radiation. Well. Plants have anthocyanins sometimes there to protect them from overexposure to sunlight, protect their cells from completely scorching and burning and turning white and eventually black and dead. It can also be a heat response. So anthocyanins are produced for a lot of different reasons, but it's, usually it's a response to the environment around them. It's a great way, color in your plants is a great way to determine if your plant's getting enough light. Because if it's not getting enough light and it's supposed to have some of this pink coloring or white coloring, that might be a sign that it's in a really low light environment. So it's not uh, being triggered to produce any of those cool colors and patterns. Okay, next thing I wanted to talk about is leaf aroma. We're kind of going through all the senses here and uh, I have lavender sprigs right here. And now this isn't in your typical houseplant lineup, but what's cool about herbs is a lot of herbs have are, are grown for their aromas and their tastes and leaves are storing and producing those oils for for a reason uh, a lot of the times it's to attract different insects beneficial pollinators or insects that are going to help the plant perform some sort of function that it can't do by itself so herbs are really cool uh, have really cool uh, leaves that hold in all of those flavors and aromas I think I have one last thing to discuss, and that has to do with that has to do with stipules. Now, stipule is kind of a funny term, and it's related to leaves because stipules are often parts of the plant that protect a new leaf as it's forming. So you know that moment when you see a new leaf start to develop, it's just a little point and it's protected, it's enclosed in this little stipule that's protecting it until the leaf is ready to pop out of it, then the stipule kind of sheds off. Well, that stipule on different plants, it can be used as a way to identify a plant in its uh, different classification. So this rubber plant has really bright pink stipules. This is a burgundy rubber plant. And those stipules, after that new leaf is produced, it pops out, then that stipule just sizes it. It cuts off, drops to the ground naturally. Now, sometimes stipules stay attached to the plant, but they don't, they're not really well attached. They just kind of flag, they kind of hang there. And philodendrons are a great example of a plant that has flagging stipules. They're still attached, but they're loose. Pothos, epipremnum, on the other hand, they are a type of plant where the stipules are actually fused to the leaf petiole the leaf stalk. There are always exceptions to the rule. However, in most cases, this is how uh, pothos and philodendron are differentiated. So that's something to tuck away in your brain. And it's kind of a fun fact to a way for you to apply morphology in real life. <laughs> I'm not just telling you all this nerdy stuff just to talk. <laughs> Anyways, so I think I've really covered the basic of leaves and plants. Uh, if you have any questions about plant leaves, let me know. And if you have any plant parts that you'd like me to cover next in this mini series, also give me a shout. But until next time, you've been watching Unearth Horticulture.